uh, a special greeting to our honored guest here this evening from all levels of government in Canada, the municipal, regional, provincial, territorial, and national. And of course, uh, to our 2018 Annual Public Policy Lecturer, Mario Dion, Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner for the Government of Canada, who's come all the way from Ottawa to be with us today. It's a great honor to have you here with us, uh, Mr. Dion. I should also like to thank our interim dean, John Justin McMurtry, from our Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies for being with us here this evening as well. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the School of Public Policy and Administration for their co-sponsorship of this evening, or this event, and the school's director, Elena Kimakova, and our graduate program director of the Master of Public Policy and Administration in Law, Dagmar Shonigan, for being with us here this evening as well. The McLaughlin College Annual Public Policy Lecture is unique to our college, and it's the premier event that we hold for the academic year. It provides our vibrant McLaughlin College community, our faculty, staff, fellows, alumni, and of course, uh, our students, with an opportunity to hear from a highly distinguished leading public figure on a major public policy concern of the day. This year's annual public policy lecture, Mr. Dion, has certainly one of the most challenging and demanding positions in public service today, and we very much look forward to hearing your lecture this evening. McLaughlin College is one of nine colleges here at York University that provides our students in eight disciplinary programs that are housed in social science, sociology, po political science, and public policy and administration with opportunities not only to enrich their educational experience, but to advance and to accelerate their learning through a wide variety of programs and activities that are geared to our college's mandate to foster knowledge in and the critical analysis of public policy with a focus on the overall improvement of society at all its levels. This distinguished lecture series is one such activity and it's a highly enriching learning experience that we give all of our students and indeed the entire McLaughlin College community. It is also worth noting that we honor and hold dear our founding head, George Tatum's emphasis on the development of the whole person by providing our students with a number of interesting intellectual pursuits in support of their studies while earning their degrees. But, and perhaps most importantly, we ensure that they also have an opportunity to partake in the arts, music, poetry, and athletics. All McLaughlin College students have the chance to engage in the wide range of activities that take place at our college through their student government, clubs, associations, as well as social activities. Engagement is the key and our extracurricular activities are the means to developing the whole person. Now, before uh, I call upon interim dean J.J. McMurtry to introduce our uh, 2018 annual public policy lecturer, I should like to call upon Muta uh, Elawash, our McLaughlin College Council President, to begin with the recognition of our First Peoples and our Indigenous Heritage by expressing York University's land acknowledgement. Uh, following Mr. Dion's lecture, there will be a question and answer portion. Um, but JJ, please come right after the land acknowledgement. Thank you so much, James. Uh, once again, my name is Mata Zahawash, and I'm the McLaughlin College President. Um, on behalf of McLaughlin College Council, I just want to say thank you so much for having us, and thank you so much for organizing this great night for us. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to read off the acknowledgement of the land. Um, on behalf of McLaughlin College, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, and the most recently, the territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit River, sorry, of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. And thank you, James, for the introduction. It's not often that I get called both John Justin, which is a term that I was disciplined by my parents with, and JJ. So thank you for ending with the friendlier term. Um, I just want to say uh, greetings from the LAMPS community. I think events like this in, in the colleges are really, really important. And some of you will have looked at your email and have seen that we're initiating, as of today, a revisioning of the colleges in order to try and meet the demands of the 21st century and our student body. And I think events like this, it's really important to recognize the historical pieces that colleges have played and the current role uh, that they play in York. And this is a perfect example. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people here. It's wonderful that the School of Public Policy and Administration and McLaughlin College are hosting an event on a Thursday night where it's a little cold and dark out there and the semester's ending to see so many uh, faces here, I think is, is wonderful and a tribute to the role that the colleges and the school play at York University. And I wanna welcome our honored guest. It's, a, it's amazing, we were joking earlier, my, my uncle uh, was involved in this field for many, many years. Uh, and it's wonderful to see somebody who I've heard about uh, to have you here. And I want to read out and maybe embarrass you a little with a few details of uh, your many accomplishments and also to say thank you so much for coming and what an honor it is to have you here. So Monsieur Dion has a distinguished, distinguished career as a Canadian government public servant before his appointment to his current position. A Montreal native, and it's wonderful uh, to have people from La Belle Province here. He obtained his law degree from the University of Ottawa in 1979 and joined the Canadian Public Service as a legal advisor with then the Ministry of the Solicitor General. He has worked in a variety of senior positions within a number of ministries, including the Privy Council Office as Deputy Clerk and Council for the Legislative House Planning and Machinery of Government. He also served as a deputy minister for the Indian Residential Schools Resolution of Canada, which I think is hugely important in our current context, where he led the, uh, and reached a historic agreement with the former residential school students. From 2006 to 2009, he served as chairperson of the National Parole Board of Canada, and from 2011 to 2014, as the commissioner of public sector inquiry and from 2015 to 2018 as the chairperson of the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. I think your talk is hugely important to our current context and uh, I welcome again everyone and especially you. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here this evening on the invitation of uh, my friend James uh, Simeon. Uh, who has uh, <clears throat> invited me to come and talk to you about uh, my new role. <clears throat> so I'm very pleased to share uh, my perspective on the development of ethics regimes that govern the conduct of federal officials. Given my current role, I've only been in this role for 10 months, so I will qualify from time to time the depth of my experience and knowledge in that capacity. So what I'd like to do this evening is uh, draw on uh, my, my experience elsewhere as well and try to help you understand my perspective. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll spend a minute or two to talk about philosophy, something we don't do often enough nowadays in my view. Uh, so what physical, philosophical approach, which uh, was informed obviously by my uh, education and experience elsewhere. I will then situate conflict of interest in the broader field of ethics and look at how ethics are relevant to politics and democracy. To provide historical context, I will discuss milestones in the development of the regimes that I now administer, the Conflict of Interest Act and the Conflict of Interest Code for members of the House of Commons, as well as some, uh, as, as well as some of some regimes for which I do not have any responsibility. I will discuss the instruments, the institution, the processes, the structures that, in my opinion, need to be in place to ensure effective ethics regimes. I will also speak about what I see as the pillars of conflict of interest regimes in particular and identify some of the features of the regimes in relation to which I currently play, play a role. I will end, finally, in no more than 45 minutes, as I was asked to, uh, with a look at what I believe the future could hold for, with respect to identifying and addressing conflicts of interest in Canada. 
So achieving philosophy first. So achieving a culture of ethics and integrity is a keystone of good governance. That's why, that's why it's important. It's also necessary for the effective functioning of democracies. So my title, Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner, is very much on point. My mandate is set out in the Parliament of Canada Act. And the, the Act says that I administer the Code and the Conflict of Interest Act. These regimes deal exclusively with conflicts of interest. They, that's what they deal with, conflicts of interest, period. Ensuring private interests are not put before the public interest when decisions are made by public officials. The latter part of my title, ethics, also form, forms part of my mandate. In that, under the Parliament of Canada Act, I may provide confidential policy advice and support to the Prime Minister in respect of conflict of interest and ethics issues in general. While the term does not otherwise appear in the regimes I administer, ethics largely determine how an individual will approach a conflict of interest situation. The, the terms, as many of you would know, of course, the term ethics is derived from the Greek word ethos, which means way of living. According to textbook definitions, it is a branch of philosophy that is concerned with human conduct, specifically the behavior of individuals in society. Ethics examines the rational justification for our moral judgments. It is the study of what is morally right or wrong, just or unjust. Individuals who hold public office, whether elected or appointed, are expected to always act in the public interest. Their decisions must be guided by the public interest and never by their private interest or those of their friends, families, or relatives. The decision-making process can be negatively impacted by a lack of la or a lapse of ethical judgment. A legal framework setting out the rules governing conduct helps to ensure that the decisions of those who hold public office are made in the public interest. Consequently, I view my role as dealing largely with ethical issues. So throughout my career in the public service, I have played a role in shaping and implementing instruments related to rules governing the conduct of public sector workers in the areas of conflict of interest and ethics. I find it's easier to apply a rule when I actually understand its theoretical foundation. It's always important to go back to the source. Why is it? What was the objective? What was the intent? What's the purpose? And in this regard, I consider myself a practitioner rather than a theorist, I'm not a theorist, but the approach informs the way I approach ethical problems. My viewpoint is also likely the result of my legal education in what, uh, because I am uh, what we call in French a civilist. It's called a civilian in English, it's called a civilist. It means uh, somebody who's not a common lawyer, essentially. In the two major legal systems in the world, we have uh, we have, of course, Aboriginal legal systems in Canada. We have the common law and we have the civil law. So I'm a civil law trained person. And uh, as you know, the civil law has a, uh, has a, a characteristic that we have a, uh, we, we, we have a focus on rules, written rules. So I therefore tend to focus much more on the literal text of the written rules contained in the code and the act that I've mentioned. Uh, before I consider past decisions, which is always interesting to look at past decisions, but it's not the first thing I do. I look at the rules, the rules as they're written, the rules as uh, what, what was the objective, the purpose of this rule. The common law, on the other hand, is de derived from judicial precedence rather than statute. An established common law rule guides a decision maker, such as a judge, in making a decision when faced with similar facts to earlier decisions. Parliament or the legislature has the power to make or amend laws, as you know. These laws take the place of the common law or precedents dealing with the same subject, and the courts must interpret the laws as a whole. So when I replaced Mary Dawson, Mary was also, she, both, she had both the common law and the civil. She was a civilian first, by the way, as you may know. My, Tim. Uh, Tim Rowland from my office, Legal Services, is here with me, and he worked with Mary Dawson, the, uh, my predecessor, the first uh, Conflict of Interest Commissioner and uh, Commissioner for Conflict of Interest and Ethics. Mary was a uh, common lawyer as well as a civilist. My approach is 
different. I think people in the office can tell, and I think that's due to some extent to my, my, uh, my legal training in the civil law. So I always want to know the decisions that Mary has made. It's, it's always interesting, uh, but I make my own interpretations under the code and the act. Uh, to the extent possible, of course, I, I will try, I have tried, I will continue to try to achieve consistency. It's important to have some predictability as well as to how the rules will be interpreted. But there are already several areas where I have interpreted a rule in a manner that is different, significantly different than the way it had been interpreted by my predecessor. I don't have, my view is that, you know, I read a rule, I interpret a rule, and uh, it's not my role to change the rule. Even if I don't like a rule, if the rule is clear, I have to implement the rule. So, and Parliament can change the rule, of course, anytime they wish to change a rule or they wish to consult me as to what, how, and uh, what rules should be changed and for what reason, I'll be pleased to share that with them. But until it's changed, it's not changed. So I, I apply it as it is. The Act is a statute, so it can only be amended by Parliament through a, through a bill, as you know, it voted in both the Senate and the House of Commons. The Code is not a statute. It's a, in fact, it's, a, it's not a well-known reality. It's, a, it's an appendix to the standing orders of the House of Commons. That's what it is. And it's the, st the standing orders are the permanent written rules under which the House of Commons regulates its proceedings. So that's the two instruments I have to, uh, to, to uh, implement. The code, just like the Act, needs parliamentary involvement in order to be amended. I cannot amend the code, I cannot amend the Act. It can only be amended through a proper pro process involving Parliament, the House of Commons, or both the House of Commons and the Senate. Historical development of ethics regime. So that's another thing I tend to do. I always try to understand how something came about. It's very, very useful in the trying to interpret the rule to know how it came about. So different countries have adopted various approaches to the development of public sector ethics frameworks. Unfortunately, I don't know if it's unfortunate, but it's a part of the human experience, I guess, it would appear that scandal often precedes progress in public sector ethics, just as accidents often precede new safety rules, the human nature, I think. For example, in the United States, the Office of Government Ethics was established under the Ethics and Government Act of 1978. So it took four years to react to the Watergate, the post-Watergate, uh, it was part of the sweeping post-Watergate reforms that were adopted at the time in the United States. The British House of Commons set up the Office of the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards, as it's called, in 1995 following the, ca the quote, cash for questions affair, so that some of you have heard about, in which two MPs were found to have accepted money from a lobbyist in exchange for asking parliamentary questions on their behalf. In Canada, various rules, some more elaborate than others, have been adopted at the federal level ever, ever since Confederation, ever since 1867, to deal with ethics issues. Their focus has evolved over the years in response to the challenges our parliamentary democracy has faced as a consequence of, again, episodes, scandals, situations. Public trust in the integrity of Canada's federal government and its institution has been shaken by a series of controversies which often prompted positive action. Successive prime ministers have also made efforts to provide clear written rules, usually shortly after an election. So it goes back to 1867. Soon after it was formed, the House of Commons adopted a rule as part of its standing orders, prohibiting members from voting on any question in which they had a direct pecuniary interest. So it goes back to the very, very formation of the House of Commons as it exists. The practice, however, was based on an honor system. A member's word was simply accepted. In 1964, there was an episode involving allegations of bribery and corruption in the House of Commons in relation to a Montreal extradition case. Lucien Rivard, who was detained at the Laval Institution, formerly known as the Saint-Vincent de Paul Penitentiary, because I worked there as well, not in the prison, but in the correctional service. So Lucien Rivard was in, uh, detained in Canada 
on a US drug or on, on various US drug charges and had contacted officials in the governing party to secure bail. The governing party was the liberal party at the time, no, it was the conservative party. So. Uh, a royal commission was appointed and several Canadian officials, including the justice minister, Guy Favreau. Several people don't know about Guy Favreau, who bears uh, the building in Montreal, big building bears his name. Younger people often don't have a clue who Guy Favreau is. So Guy Favreau was the minister of justice in 1962 when this controversy erupted. And the, this affair prompted then Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson to write a letter to his ministers and colleagues. And in this letter, he sets out a code of ethics and morality for them and their staff to follow in performing public responsibilities. So again, you had an incident followed by a reaction, a good reaction. In this letter, he forbade clearly bribery and conflicts of interest. In 1973, then Privy Council President Alan McEachern tabled a green paper that recommended adopting legislation to prevent conflicts of interest by members and senators. It divided conflict of interest in, into four areas. Corrupt practices and prohibited fees. Number two, incompatible offices. Number three, government contracts. And finally, Number four, financial interest. That same year, Prime Minister, not Justin, but Pierre Elliott Trudeau, introduced conflict of interest guidelines for cabinet ministers, as well as guidelines for various groups of public servants and governor and council appointees were adopted at the same time, virtually at the same time, in 1973. And in, in a speech to parliament, the House of Commons, I guess, in, back in uh, July of 1973. That's a strange day on which to be in Parliament, but Mr. Trudeau explained why the government adopted guidelines in lieu of legislation. He said, and I quote, the government believes that no higher standards should be demanded of anyone than of ministers themselves. That's still true today, I think, based on my experience in this uh, new role. They would, of course, as members of parliament or senators, be subject to all the provisions that would apply to members of those bodies, whether by law, by resolution, or by custom. But because of their unique duties and responsibilities, ministers should, however, be required to conform to a series of guidelines which impose added restraints, particularly in relation to pecuniary interests. The government has, con has concluded that guidelines are preferable to additional legislation, specifically relating to ministers, since certain aspects of conduct cannot readily be defined except in relation to particular circumstances. An element of discretion to be exercised by a minister on the basis of a discussion with the prime minister of the day seems to be the best solution. So that was his conclusion in 1973. In 1974, Mr. Trudeau appointed Canada's first federal conflict of interest administrator, as he was called. He uh, held the, title, the level of an assistant deputy minister in the former Department of Consumer and Corporate Affairs. In 1979, Prime Minister Joe Clark issued new conflict of interest guidelines for cabinet ministers, including, this time including their spouses and dependent children. The guidelines created categories of assets. So you'll see when I describe the current regime, the origin, it, it, it is essentially forming before our, our eyes. So in 1979, inclusion of family members, dependent children, and definition of categories of asset, specifying which ones require public disclosure or, or divestment, and prohibited certain professional, corporate, and commercial activities. Mr. Clark was defeated in December of 1979. Mr. Trudeau came back. Welcome to the 80s. I'm old enough to remember the, uh, the scene on TV live. In 1980, Mr. Trudeau came back and issued a revised set of guidelines similar to those issued by Mr. Clark, but the provisions dealing with spouses and dependent children were removed. So Mr. Trudeau, in his wisdom, thought that he, uh, he would not do what Mr. Clark had done in his own uh, code. Then, in the so-called Gillespie affairs, a former minister in Mr. Trudeau's government allegedly lobbied his former deputy minister. 
In a response, a task force of, on conflict of interest was appointed in 1983 and reported the following year. So its report, known as the Star Sharp Report, recommended creating a code of conduct and establishing an independent office of public sector ethics with an ethics counselor. In 1985, Prime Minister Brian Maloney, he's the father of Carolyn Mulroney, for you, those of you who are younger, um, Prime Minister Brian Maloney issued the first conflict of interest and post-employment code for public office holders. This was the first time, 1985 based on a number of the star sharp recommendations. While non-statutory, this, this code consolidated in a single document, the rules for ministers, parliamentary secretaries, ministerial staff, political staff, as well as governor and council appointees, and covered matters such as gifts, outside activities, confidential disclosures, recusals, divestment, and blind trusts. In 1986, a commission of inquiry known as the Parker Commission was appointed to examine and report. He was an Ontario judge, I think, Judge Justice Parker, uh, was appointed to examine and report on allegations of conflict of interest related to former cabinet minister Sinclair Stevens. It recommended redesigning the ADM position that I was talking about and giving it a separate and a more visible status. In 1994, Prime Minister Jean Chrétien appointed the first ethics counselor, a position that replaced the assistant deputy registrar general. So it was called a counselor. It's a different, not an EDM, not a public servant, but some, maybe a public servant, but somebody whose title is counselor, which is very different from commissioner or something else. Reporting to the Prime Minister, the counselor at jurisdiction, Howard Wilson was his name, and Howard had the jurisdiction over two of the most important integrity instruments of the time, that is the Lobby Registration Act and the Conflict of Interest and Post-Employment Code for Public Office Holders. In 2004, the federal sponsorship scandal was uncovered. Also in 2004, under Prime Minister Paul Martin, the position of Senate Ethics Officer and Ethics Commissioner the first independent office to administer conflict of interest rules for members and public office holders were created. The conflict of interest code, the one I'll be talking about later, was adopted in 2004. In 2006, under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, Parliament passed the Federal Accountability Act, which replaced several earlier instruments that were part of the federal ethics framework. And the, for the Federal Accountability Act, as it was called, included the Conflict of Interest Act and the new position of Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner. So that's in 2006, adopted in 2006, proclaimed in 2007. The Conflict of Interest rules for public office holders are complemented and reinforced by the Prime Minister's own guidelines at this time. They were issued uh, starting in the early 2000s as a guide and uh, by the Prime Minister. The current version is called Open and Accountable Government and was issued by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in 2015. The integrity of the government's decision-making process is further assured by rules governing the behavior of all 270 public servants, 1,000, 270,000 obviously, public servants from the clerk of the Privy Council to the frontline employees. You probably have heard about the 1997 report of the Task Force on Public Service Values and Ethics, known as the Tate Report. And it was key in strengthening the conflict of interest regime for public servants. The task force was led by the late John Tate, former Deputy Minister of Justice at the federal level, with whom I had the honor of working. And he was a senior fellow at the time at the Canadian Center for Management Development, as it was then called. So I worked with Mr. Tate as an assistant deputy minister in the early 1990s. And in fact, he had tasked me in 1992 when I came on board at the Department of Justice as an assistant deputy minister. Mr. Tate asked me to decide on his behalf. He delegated formally the authority under the criminal code, by the way, section 121 of the criminal code, 
and also by virtue of all the public service instruments, he delegated to me the authority over conflict of interest issues within the Department of Justice. The structures surrounding conflict of interest were still quite new. There was a need to change internal practices within justice to ensure that conflict of interest situations did not arise. So the task force examined public service issues and the principles and practices of our parliamentary democracy and stressed the importance of values that could help provide a foundation for the behavior of public servants. It struck a balance between values and rules and was instrumental in the shift from an excessive focus on rules to a more values-based approach while recognizing the importance of having some rules. It also promoted the concept of public interest as central to a professional public service. This was a, at the time, 1997 and on, a major revolution within the federal public service. I remember it as being a very, very important change. Uh, oh, there were years of uh, efforts invested in transforming the culture of the federal public sector following the Tate report. So what we currently have, our regime, is the result of a positive and enthusiastic response to the Tate report, because the time had come for it as well. I think it's evolutive, but the Tate report was a catalyst to basically accelerate evolution and uh, make sure that uh, the culture of the public service would receive shock treatment in order to transform itself more quickly than it otherwise might have had. Um, so they adopted the uh, public service values and ethics in the Treasury Board of Canada and the, uh, also an organizational code of conduct for each department. Now as, by law, there is a requirement to have their own code of uh, ethics in each department. So the overall uh, values and ethics code was adopted in 2012. We always take a few years, just, just like the Watergate, 74, 78. 1997, the code was adopted in 2012, 15 years after the Tate report. Uh, but it was because it was required by the accountability, it was required by law. The Treasury Board had no choice, basically the Accountability Act required the adoption of a code. And it took five years to do so, so it's, it is a good code. Finally, my predecessor adopted a similar code of values and standards. Mary did that, Mary Dawson did that within the office. We have our own code of values and standards of conduct within the office. And the code is uh, available on the web as everything else concerning the office that can be made public. So I wish to emphasize the evolutive nature, I think I've done so, of the federal conflict of interest regimes. So we have at this point the Conflict of Interest Act it applies to regulate the conduct of about 2,300 people, 2,300 among the most senior people in the public service. I said 270,000, that's the totality of the federal public service, the immediate core public service, because then you have a larger, more extensive public service that has close to 500,000 people in it. Uh, so the, the Conflict of Interest Act, 2,300 people. That's what my office focuses on. It includes ministers, it includes every staff member in a minister's office, from the driver to the chief of staff. It includes parliamentary secretaries, and it includes governor and council appointees, people who are appointed by the government as opposed to through a process under the Public Service Employment Act. So that's one instrument, 2,300 people. The other one is the Conflict of Interest Code for members of the House of Commons applying to 338 elected members of Parliament. Throughout their development, the aim has been to support and enhance public confidence and trust in the integrity of those holding public office in Canada. That's the goal. That's stated in the introductory portions of both the Act and the Code. They evolved from a values-based to a rules-based approach. The Act and the Code help provide a foundation for the desired behaviors of elected and appointed officials who are expected to act in the public interest and place the public interest ahead of their other interests. Their focus is largely on ensuring that members of parliament and public office holders do not use their position to further their private, largely pecuniary interest or the private interest of their relatives and friends in the case of the Act, or to improperly further the private interest of anyone else. 
They set out various rules of conduct to ensure transparency through disclosure and public declaration requirements. That's a very, very important aspect of all this. They also contain enforcement provisions in the Act. These include administrative monetary penalties of up to $500 for failures to meet certain reporting requirements. And the issuance also have the power to issue compliance orders to ensure that public office holders meet their obligations in the future. In addition, uh, formal investigations of possible contraventions may be conducted under both regimes. And my reports on those investigations are made public the minute they are sent to the speaker and or the prime minister. So in administering the regime, my office provides public office holders and members with confidential advice Anything we discuss with the public office holder or a member of parliament, of course, is confidential. Our job is to provide them with advice, with guidance, and sometimes with orders. So we have the authority to order certain things as well. We also seek opportunities to educate them individually and collectively about the rules, how these rules apply to them, and any broader considerations. So an effective ethics regime, in my view, must be supported by effective instruments. So we've talked about principles, we've talked about evolution, rules, but you also need the instruments, the tools, the processes, the structures. So if effective instruments are written rules that clearly set out the conduct expected of those who hold public office. For example, conflict of interest guidelines, codes, or statutes have been adopted by all levels of government now. If we 14 jurisdictions in Canada have an instrument of some nature and an official as well who is responsible, my counterpart if you wish. There are important differences vis-a-vis -vis our precise mandate, but every jurisdiction in Canada now has a counterpart to me. Or they are counterparts or I'm counterparts to them, I don't know, but anyway, we have uh, one person in each jurisdiction. I see Valerie in the room, so I'll be careful about the the Fed's not taking precedence over anybody else. Uh, effective institutions are independent, impartial oversight bodies that administer the rules. So independent, impartial, very important. So my status as an officer of the House of Commons means that I'm solely responsible to Parliament and not to the federal government or not to a minister. These written rules are given weight and meaning to the structures and processes put in place to enforce them. So we have a registry on the web, accessible 24 seven. I'll touch wood because it does break down from time to time. So we have a public registry of publicly declarable information under the Conflict of Interest Act and the code for members of the House of Commons. So there are, there are four pillars in my view. If you, somebody who wants to construct a conflict of interest regime should think about four things. Accountability. So somebody must be responsible and answerable for his own actions or her own actions, subject to consequences. Mem so they are the epicenter, members of the House of Commons, the public office holders are the epicenter where conflicts of interest arise. They are responsible for their own action. So my role is not to replace them or to uh, make sure that uh, I tell everyone what they should do every day of the week. It's their role. I'm, I'm simply an instrument to assist them in fulfilling their own responsibilities. So they're accountable. Number two, transparency. So openness, clarity, access and, and disclosures when interacting or on behalf of the public. So that's, that's, why, that's what registries are for. They have to declare certain things. They have to declare a recusation, for instance, when they recuse themselves. So a, a media representative, a member of the public, a professor may actually study what's happened in relation to a public office holder or a member of parliament in particular. The third uh, aspect is fairness. So we, uh, we pay a lot of attention to that in my office. We try our best to treat people equally in a reasonable way, impartially and honestly. So it requires impartial procedures and a lack of bias on the part of decision makers. And then consistency. Consistency is uh, easy to explain. It's not always easy to implement. So we have uh, to make sure that we act in the same coherent and logical way. 
So I've introduced a mission statement in the office. Uh, the month after I was appointed, basically, within a month, we, uh, I somewhat autocratically, what about, autocratic, that's right, autocratically is the adverb. But uh, there was some consultation, they were a bit shallow. So the, the mission statement says, the Office of the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner provides independent, rigorous, that's also important, rigorous and consistent direction and advice to members of parliament and federal public office holders, comma, conducts investigations, and comma, where necessary, comma, makes use of appropriate sanctions in order to ensure full compliance with the act and the code. Accountability, fairness, transparency, and consistency are reflected in the act and the code themselves. So the act contains a provision that makes compliance a condition of employment. So breaching, breaching a provision, a substantive provision of the act, directly goes to the person's employment. It is a condition of employment to abide by the act. Or a condition of appointment as well. The Act also has an administrative, penalties, administrative monetary penalty scheme, which I've uh, mentioned. That's to give us some teeth for the vis-a-vis -vis the completeness and timeliness of the information that they have. They are required by law to, by law or by the code, to provide my office with. The regimes uh, are transparent. For instance, both the Act and the code require those holding public office to make public declarations of some of their interests. There, these declarations are accessible to the public through the public registry, a searchable instrument maintained by our office. The Act also gives me the discretion to make public any document I deem appropriate. Those are the words in the statute. I've started to do some of that, case by case, depending on the situation. Again, bearing in mind the objective of public, what is the objective of publication? What is the objective of the Act? Is that something that should be published, even though it has not been routinely published in the past? My reports on investigations and possi of possible contraventions of the Act and the Code are also made public, as I said earlier. Fairness. Uh, we, the Act says the, the manner in which we deal with members of Parliament and uh, public office holders under the Act must be informed by the duty to act fairly, obviously. We have uh, the principles of fundamental justice to bear in mind every time we make a decision. So both the Code and the Act provide the subject of an investigation a reasonable opportunity to make representations, and they are, they are using that opportunity. In every case I've been involved with at this point, it's a flexible, uh, it's for the benefit of the public office holder and or the MP, so it's not a rigid approach. It's basically the right to be assisted by a person of your choice, the right to see certain documents, the right to, we have a procedure, but it's not rigid. Again, it evolves with the, uh, the requirements of the specific situation. Um, we give the subject, for instance, an opportunity to review their transcript. When they come before us, they testify. There's a court reporter, there's a transcript. We share the transcript if they wish. We also offer them the possibility to see excerpts of transcripts from witnesses, other witnesses, and other relevant documents. And each time we, before the report is published, we're about to publish a couple of reports, by the way, if everything goes according to plan, before Christmas, we will have published two additional reports. We always give them the factual portion of the draft report in advance, so they have a chance to comment and suggest changes to the factual portions of the report, of the draft report. My office ensures consistency and coherence in the interpretation and application of the Act and the Code, although I'm not bound by previous decisions, my previous decisions, and all determination must take into account the particular facts of the situation. Consistency and co coherence are necessary to minimize confusion and uncertainty. There are, there are lots of gray areas in, uh, in the regimes we administer, so we, should, we are taking steps to try to minimize, not it says eliminate, but I changed the words, Tim, for future reference. We cannot eliminate confusion, but we can try to minimize confusion and uncertainty. Uh, 
The Act uh, says a few things about the need for consistency, so we have to abide by that. Uh, so, future possibilities. So the, the, the poster said uh, key milestones in the past. And I did is, um, I just like to share with you what is a possible vision for the future. A vision means things that I think might happen. Not necessarily that I would like them to happen, it's a different thing. It's not an objective, it's a, I think that, you know, I could have thought in 1955 that color TV would come one day, so, okay? So, so it's akin to that. So what do I see in the future? And uh, when in my discussions with uh, Professor Simeon, I offered the uh, 50 year as a possible horizon. So it's a long horizon. Things are changing so quickly nowadays. So what, what could we see in the next 50 years? Society has changed, government has changed. I'm talking Canada, of course, because I don't have the pretension of, um, I'm, I'm still studying Canada, so I, I don't have the pretension of being able to discuss this on a global scale, obviously. Canada has changed <coughs> since the early days of public ethics regimes. Canada continues to evolve. Since the act came into force in 2007, for instance, it's not that long ago, it's 11 years ago, technology has uh, become increasingly more sophisticated and economic exchanges are much more complex even after only 11 years. For example, people can now use their private assets for commercial activities such as Uber and Airbnb. We've come across those situations in a real way in the office. The concept of who may be considered a friend has become more complex in the wake of interactions and connectivity via social media platforms. Diversity, writ large, continues to grow. New generations of Canadians and from many cultural backgrounds have entered public life. If you look at the House of Commons today, the House of Commons 40 years ago, it's very different. They bring with them diverse values, experiences, ways of looking at things. There's more interaction between the public and the private sectors as well than there used to be. So the rules governing the conduct of elected and appointed public officials must follow suit. They must be adapted to acknowledge and reflect these and other changes. As I said earlier, only Parliament can decide to change the Act and only the House of Commons can change the code. First possibility, a possible scenario. That's what I should do. It's a scenario. It's a possible scenario. Uh, so I'm not advocating for or against any particular course of action, but I will simply describe what I envision for the future. That's important. So we must keep in mind that how the Act and the Code currently work. Both these regimes defi define inappropriate behavior. However, when it comes to finding out whether public office holders and members have behaved inappropriately, they are both largely complaint driven. In fact, Mary Dawson declared before a House committee that uh, I think it's three quarters of her investigations, and she completed 37. 37, three quarters of those investigations emerged out of, a, of information transmitted to her by the public, as opposed to a complaint made by a member of parliament or a senator. I read that. Three quarters, two thirds, I'm not sure, but something of that nature. I was surprised to read that, by the way. So, because when you read the act and the code, they are really visibly complaint driven. And information coming to the fore is, uh, comes as a second, an afterthought, basically, in, in the rules. But in practice, it has come from the public. So. so, communication, education, and outreach can therefore help prevent conflict of interest from arising. Section 32 of the code requires me to undertake educational activities for members of parliament and the general public regarding the code. So we give uh, presentations, we, uh, we now have uh, YouTube videos, so the public should be educated because the public, public still has a very vague notion of what the commissioner does. So I get complaints about all kinds of things, you know, air quality in Winnipeg, I get complaints about uh, opening hours of liquor stores in Yellow Knife and so on and so forth. Uh, so we will use, we have started, we have a YouTube channel, by the way, called Ethics Canada. There is no process, so it was easy. I uh, basically created a name, it's called Ethics Canada. So people can figure out it's about ethics and it's in Canada. Anybody else who wants to use the, the, the channel, of course, is free to do so. Uh, we're, uh, we're also using Twitter much more than we used to. 
my hope is that uh, we, we now have close to 800 followers, which is double what it was in April. And that's a cheap way to educate people who have an interest in the subject matter. The, uh, so the importance of education and outreach uh, is, uh, so, so I'm talking about the intern, just to show how important it is. So something came up since the office has been there for 11 years. There are interns and in, uh, interns, people like you, students, who after, shortly after they leave school, uh, are sponsored by an organization and go and work in a members of parliament office. Dozens of students like that, or interns, at no cost to the members. Such arrangements benefit the members by providing free labor, free to them, they're being paid but not by them, they benefit the interns by giving them parliamentary experience. And they could also benefit the sponsoring organizations, some of which are registered to lobby the House of Commons. So it never, it likely never occurred to members that accepting free intern services could pause a conflict, a conflict of interest vis-a-vis -vis the sponsoring organization. At that point, any conflict of interest might be latent or potential, but unchecked could become a manifest or a rising conflict of interest. Later, for example, if the sponsoring organization wanted something from a member to whom it had given free intern services, and we're talking about weeks and weeks of free labor, such as the member's support in a vote, in a debate, the conflict of interest would develop fully. So in short, it would be known and noticed. So to prevent from any conflict of interest from reaching that stage earlier this fall, I issued an advisory opinion also referred to as a bomb in Ottawa, I guess. So the, the opinion came out, was like a mini bomb, Poof. because it was a age old practice, nobody ever thought about it. So I made it clear in this opinion that any intern services provided free of charge by a third party are benefits as defined in the code. They are therefore subject to the code's acceptability test for gifts. The code prohibits members and their family from accepting directly or indirectly any gift or other benefit that might reasonably be seen to have been given to influence the member in the exercise of a duty or function of their office. So the ability to proactively monitor. So that's one trend I see, one possible future is that an official like me here at the federal level or at the provincial, territorial level or municipal level, having the, author the authority to proactively monitor could help identify and assess latent conflicts before they are allowed to develop further. And then it crossed my mind that maybe artificial intelligence, because we're not using artificial intelligence, we're using sometimes natural intelligence, to, um, so we could put to use artificial intelligence to compare data to, to do quick data analysis. Because we look at things vertically. We look at the declaration of a member this year, the declaration of the member last year, the declaration of the member next year, but never between members. We don't, because we don't have the capacity to do so. Uh, I'm just picking an example. So one day a system could be developed that contains data not only on specific public office holders, such as their assets and liabilities, but also on official decisions that they have made or are about to make, to have to make. The system would be able to automatically generate the red flags that would alert the public office holder or member, as well as the commissioner. Then conflict of interest could be avoided or addressed right away. Of course, the tricky part would be how to obtain and input data on decisions. Privacy could be an issue. Given the, that election or appointment to public office is a choice, public office holders and members could contractually agree to become subject to such a system. So that's one area. Citizen oversight is another area where we might see some major changes in the next 50 years. I envision much better and easier access for the public at large to share information and concerns about possible conflict of interest. Currently, anyone who has a concern can contact my office by email, telephone, or post. But perhaps one day there will be an app that would make such disclosure easier and more accessible. That could lead to more investigations. More investigations could lead in turn to greater vigilance by public office holders and members in meeting their obligations under the Act and the Code. 
At present, as I said earlier, we have a searchable public registry, but it's not an intelligent one. It's a searchable one. That's all it is. And it's difficult to identify any patterns in the data it contains. Plus, my office is required to remove the data once a member of the House of Commons is no longer a member, as you saw earlier this week. And after a public office holder's one, one or two year cooling off period has ended. So the registry utility could be uh, increased significantly in the, in the near future. The conflict of interest code for senators is much broader in its application than the conflict of interest code for members of the House of Commons. The Senate code covers conducts expected of the office. So it's not only about pecuniary matters. That was the Meredith situation last year, which did not involve pecuniary interest, but was never the subject the less the subject of investigation under the code governing the conduct of senators. That's another potential evolution that I see in the future. So even if no important conclusion, so it means dinner is coming closer, um, even if for you, I mean, even if no important changes are made to the conflict of interest regimes and their administration in the future, I believe there are already effective components of Canada's ethics framework. In fact, I think, based on the visits I've had with uh, foreigners up until now, uh, Canada is looked at uh, as an international leader in the field of conflict of interest. And we'll have a question and answer period. We can debate that. My office regularly hosts delegations from the governments and ethics authorities of countries around the world that seek to learn from us. This week alone, I had, uh, within the last 10 days, I had uh, the Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, and I had uh, South Korea in my office. A counterpart from South Korea. The regime's effectiveness also relies on how they are administered and how seriously they are viewed by those subject to them. So I believe that rigor on the part of my office is very important. We expect rigor from public office holders and members in meeting their obligations and we exercise rigor in reviewing how they are meeting their obligations. My concept is that public, office, uh, public officials and ethics commissioners are not adversaries. In fact, they are partners. They should work together to uphold the highest standards of integrity in support of the effective functioning of democracy in Canada. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're still looking, I think. So how would you like to proceed for a question period? I stay where I am, or we share yes, the mic? No, okay. you stay where okay. you are. So uh, we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Please use the microphone at the time. Uh, Monsieur Dion, <clears throat> uh, first of all, thank you very much for that wonderful canvassing of the history uh, and complexity of the ethics acts. Um, I find it a fascinating subject and area of governmental <clears throat> uh, position. When I, when I think about this, you know, the idea of uh, helping uh, elected and appointed officials to avoid uh, conflicts between private interests and public interests in your role, uh, and in, to ensure that there is no pecuniary interest that becomes questionable. I can't help but think about, uh, if we go back, you went back historically, uh, going back to James Madison's comment in uh, Federalist Paper Number 51, in which he said, among other things, that in framing a government to be administered by men over men, which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, mm -hmm. and in the next place, oblige it, the government, to control itself. Um, and what I'd like to ask you is, uh, given your relatively short tenure uh, since about February of this year, uh, having uh, inherited the position from Mary Dawson, who, like you, uh, is a, well, uh, has been a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't come out of the civil law tradition, um, 
and uh, being mindful of the codification of civil law, unlike the presidential nature of common law, and given the values at work, given the, the challenges that you foresee, perhaps, and the experience you've had thus far in the position of Ethics and Conflict of Interest Commissioner, what would you say has been the greatest challenge for you in this capacity hmm. thus far? That's an interesting question. <clears throat> the, the greatest challenge, I think, we, we are first and foremost reactive at this point in time. So we, the system is based on uh, people relying. Uh, we have to rely on what people tell us. We have to react to uh, what they tell us as part of their obligation to declare initially or annually or when they call us. But it is a challenge to know that there are hundreds of things happening each day on which we are not being called. And I find that uh, difficult to live with because we deal probably, I think, with the tip of the iceberg. And, uh, but you know, it's better than not having a regime. But that, it's not really a challenge. It's uh, the greatest dilemma, if you wish, the, the greatest paradox, I find, in, uh, in what we're doing. We can spend... Uh, multiple hours analyzing a relatively innocuous situation that somebody has brought to our attention, while at the same time somebody might be trading billions of dollars that we don't know about. So, so that, I find that difficult. Um, timeliness, so challenge. I believe in, you know, in 2018 we're dealing, we should be dealing with uh, things in real time. So we see rigor, we see consistency, but we also have to do it more quickly than maybe it has been done traditionally uh, <clears throat> because things go very fast. And number two, the image of the office depends to some extent to uh, the speed with which it is seen as being able to deal with matters. So that's the greatest challenge. Basically. It's not speed for the sake of speed. It's speed for the, the sake of perception of efficiency and value for money, essentially because we're driven by speed and money nowadays. So, yes. Thank you. Okay. And by the way, those are my, my candid views after a very long uh, tenure of uh, something like 300 days. So, okay. My name's Ian Green. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, and I think you're right. Canada is really a world leader in terms of uh, preventing conflicts of interest. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about CCOIN, the Canadian Conflict of Interest Net Network, and your relations with the commissioners in, in the provinces and what you learn from each other. So first of all, CCOIN stands for the Canadian Conflict of Interest Network. So it's not an institute, it's not a, uh, it's not a uh, formal organization, it's only a network. It was created in 1992 by uh, somebody I had the pleasure of working with on the Indian Residential Schools file, Ted Hughes, who used to be the Ethics Commissioner in the North, Yukon or Northwest Territories, I don't remember. So Ted Hughes in 1992 wrote a charter, a mandate for terms of reference for a thing called CCOIN, which I only joined last year or earlier this year. Uh, I, had, uh, I only had one meeting and one conference call. It's, uh, and already I'm prepared to say that it is very valuable because we have very few people we can talk to about anything. Uh, it's an evolving uh, discipline. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I consider myself blessed to be able to pick up the phone and call Paul Davis, for instance, or call uh, people who have much more experience than me, the lady in Alberta, and so on and so forth. We, we have informal, we don't discuss cases, by the way, we don't name anyone. We talk about situations that we never, we never breach confidentiality, of course, but we have informal discussions. We have an annual meeting with an agenda, uh, but no minutes, because we don't want this to become either a bureaucracy or an access to information fantasy of some sort. So, because it's, it should be informal discussions. That's what it is. That's all it is. We have an agenda. The agenda is public. We share material for every decision of every commissioner as a result of an investigation is shared with every other commissioner. That's great. My office provides a secretariat for that. So you need, uh, we don't have a, an army of staff, but we have one person who as part of our duties coordinates 
the sending of decisions made by other commissioners, <coughs> uh, as well as judicial decisions that are made in any jurisdiction in Canada that could have an interest for other commissioners as well. So it's great. It's a great thing. I'm, uh, very, I consider myself very lucky that it, it is in existence. And Ted was a, uh, again, uh, foresaw the future. I think he was a, he was a visionary in 1992. It's almost 30 years ago that this started. So. If you tell them any of this, I will deny having said that. Because, no. <laughs> but but I, really, I really believe what I said. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Chelsea Chelborough. I'm a recent transfer into uh, York Social Sciences program, and I'm really interested in the kinds of things that uh, someone in your position might do. Uh, you mentioned in terms of looking out for things that will change in the future. One of those things will be the way that civilians engage with reporting conflicts of interests or potential conflicts of interests. So. Going forward 50 years in an age where things like doxing can happen to people who whistleblow, how do we encourage and protect whistleblowers? Not, not just like making it safe for people to do these things in the first place, but making sure they are protected after they do so in a digital age. So there is a, uh, as you may probably know, there's a, uh, there's a statutory protection at the federal level called the Public Servants Disclosure Protection Act. It's been a, it's, it was part of the same Accountability Act. When we receive information from a citizen, it's usually anonymous. Okay? We still guard the, uh, the nature of the disclosure, even though it's anonymous, and even because you, you can always guess, you think you can guess who it is. So, so they still have to be protected, even though anonymous. Uh, and we will, uh, we, we currently have a completely encrypted uh, system within, within the Hill whereby we can transfer information in a secure fashion. But in my view, we will never achieve complete protection because of, uh, you know, there is a balance between the principles of fundamental justice and the, the person's desire to disclose the situation. The person who's, uh, against whom the allegations are made, does have the right to know what is alleged against him or her. So there is a, there is a zone where you actually have to share some information, not necessarily the identity of the person, but again, it's sometimes possible to guess who it is. So complete protection, in my view, is an illusion. No media in the room, I hope, because this would be a good title, right? No. Complete protection is an illusion. Okay. Okay. <laughs> See, Monsieur Dion. Uh, so I'm going to speak on behalf of students. I teach a uh, public policy and ethics course in the. Okay, let me go backwards. <laughs> ethics and public service in the public policy department with Ian Green and Ian Stedman. And students, after thinking about the complexity, the humanity, the social psychology behind everything that goes into ethics, always ask. Why do I have mandatory assignments, but these elected officials appointed and other individuals are not mandated to read the code of ethics? Like, we can go through all levels of government and students always ask, if I may say it this way, how come these idiots didn't know the rules? There are uh, some places where uh, the people have an obligation to read on an annual basis. Department by department, they have they each have a code of conduct. There are some departments where there is such a requirement. I, I recall that faintly, uh, but there isn't one at the uh, <clears throat> at the uh, general level. Nor is there in our code or in our act. But people are not children either. You know, when you belong to the uh, the top one percent of the, uh, the class in the, in the federal system, because I said twenty three hundred out of two hundred seventy thousand. These people are generally the best paid people. So they're not children. They, uh, they know that the act exists. We produce information notices. We have a website. We now produce videos, by the way. So uh, and each time, pardon me? Video and the on the using OK, good. So my, my own personal view is that people are not children, that you don't, you're, not, you're not required to read the criminal code either. And if you breach it, you will be prosecuted. So it's, it's essentially the same. You're, I find it a little bit childish to require people to read something. They should be uh, intelligent enough to know that they should spend a few minutes doing it. That's my own view again, sorry. Yes. I think the Senate code says that they have to read it every yeah, year. Yeah, that's yeah. right. 
Speaking yeah, of so children having people to except for so that firms are not children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Uh, I have a question about your administrative monetary penalties. So you're effectively allowed to impose a penalty, and there's no one else who has a say in that penalty in this particular instance. No, they do have a say. They have an opportunity to be heard. They have 30 days to tell me why they think I should not impose the proposal. But nobody penalty. can veto you if you say it has to. No, that's right. So okay. Yeah. So that's the only. Those are the only things that the punishment that you can dole out, right? Otherwise, it's recommending back to. Okay, if it's under if it's under the act, I have not nothing in the act says I can recommend anything, and Ma Ma Mary has not really recommended anything mm -hmm. by way of sanction in the act in relation to the act. In relation to the code, there are provisions that says, in fact, it's clear that under the code I may recommend and only recommend what should happen to the member of parliament who we have found has breached the code, and because the code discusses uh, circumstances, if it's uh, if it's uh, What's the word? If it's um, in, Tim is with me for that reason. If it's involuntary, if it is clearly an oversight, for instance. Pardon me? Made in good faith, so on and so forth. So there are provisions clearly that try to regulate how I should cast, cast my recommendations. But under the act, I have no such power. But, but the Prime Minister gets every report, and, the, and it is a condition of employment. So the Prime Minister, I guess, although the Act doesn't say that, is the person who has to decide what the consequence will be. And we have no feedback loop to, for me to know what the consequence has been, if any. So. And maybe I'll seek a feedback one day, when I have more than 300 days of experience. Okay, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Grant Wedge. I work for the Government of Ontario. And the question, you've talked about diversity in the civil service. Um, I've certainly been aware of situations where Indigenous people have come into the civil service. And the question's been raised whether they have to go through a conflict of interest screening because there is an initiative that in, may involve their community or their national group. Uh, there may be litigation, et cetera. And my experience has been that people are making very strict uh, rulings about uh, if you're from that community, you can't be involved in anything involved with that community. But of course, someone working in municipal affairs, a resident of Toronto, isn't barred in our system from being involved in something in municipal affairs that's dealing with the municipality where they're living. I'm curious what your sense is about how we balance the participation of Indigenous people in the civil service and this sense that, well, if it involves your community, you'd have to be screened out of any involvement in that matter. Well, I've had uh, one situation where this issue arose in the last 10 months, <coughs> and it's funny because we did discuss the, the need for a balance between uh, <coughs> participation and uh, the reality of a small, it's, a, it's like a small community. You know? uh, <coughs> so the individual was a senior person uh, coming from a uh, reserve and who was involved in relation to a pro an important project involving the reserve. So we did discuss this issue, but uh, you know, one case uh, is uh, obviously not enough to uh, really provide any uh, education or view. Uh, but And then there, are, there are other realities as well involving other groups in society. That, uh, so it's, it's a very complex area. I think that's why the Act, the Code, I haven't said that per se, but the Act, the Code, leaves a lot of discretion to the Commissioner. And that's one area where the commissioner can use his, his or her discretion to, uh, in the right way when there are no rules barring him from doing so. You know? so, so I do intend to do that, to learn more about uh, you know, my, uh, my three years at Indian Residential Schools Resolution Canada, not the schools, but the resolution of the situation, uh, has uh, provided me a lot of uh, opportunity to better understand the situation of Aboriginal peoples. And we will certainly, when it does arise, uh, take that into account. Uh, I'm afraid the uh, question uh, portion has ended. I'd like to call upon the immediate past head of McLaughlin College to thank our speaker. Thank you very much. One of uh, the skills that I have developed through, through many years uh, of academic and public activity is interrupting really fascinating discussions to move things on to, to the next stage. So here I am exercising my unique skill. 
Thank you very much, Monsieur Guillaume. Uh, your overview has been masterful, uh, entirely expected, but uh, wonderful nonetheless. Uh, the premise that you began with is clearly a premise we all share as interested uh, members of an academic community and as citizens. We want our public officials to act in the public interest rather than in the private interest. And as you have pointed out, the private interest is largely pecuniary interest, but not exclusively so. And the boundaries of where that extends goes far beyond what you've had time to, to talk about today. Yes, cash for votes is a clear private interest that, that is of a pecuniary sort. But we understand all elected politicians should act in the interests of their constituents. To be reelected, they must act in the interests of their constituents. So votes for questions is OK, but cash for questions is not. Uh, and, and that just is an indication of the, the very interesting life that, that you live. And thank you for doing that on all of our behalf. On behalf of McLaughlin College, I would like to present you with this non-conflict of interest token of our appreciation. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to bring an end to uh, this portion of this evening. And um, for all of those wh who will be joining us for dinner at Schulich, uh, hopefully we can continue some of this conversation there. And uh, before I conclude, I just wanted to send uh, uh, regrets. We, uh, regrets from President Rhonda Lenton, who happens to be a fellow of McLaughlin College. She was unable to join us this evening and uh, the uh, Vice President Academic and Provost Lisa Phillips was unable to attend as well and she wanted to send her, her regrets as well. So hope to see you over at Schulich for dinner this evening. Thank you.